Please. But we're going to get stuck uh, into these straight away. First question for you, Dr. Nichols. What should a high schooler's week look like if they're sold out for Jesus? I'm going to put a little spin on this question. You know, you've, I've heard this answer differently with church history people. If you knew uh, Christ was coming back tomorrow night, what would your day look like? And the, the legend is that, that Luther was asked this story, and basically he starts walking through a normal day is what his day would be like. So I think I want to pull that into this answer. It's, it's being faithful in what God has called you to be and where God has called you to be and doing what God has called you to be. So being a sold-out-for-God high schooler, which is very commendable, is about being faithful as a high schooler, being a faithful student, being a faithful friend, being a faithful son or daughter, and in that you're being a faithful Christian sold out for God. I imagine some of the question behind the question, maybe is there a prescription for what spiritual disciplines look like, you know, every day? And of course, I know there's not a uh, set criteria, this is what you must do, but could you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. And I caught a little bit of, of the uh, engagement, the, the, the what now session, and I thought that there were some good answers in there from both Bo and, and from Brooke. And I thought some of the things you brought out in the panel were very helpful as well. When you go into 1 Peter 3.15, it's not, let me go find you and let me bring the gospel to you. It's people are going to seek you out. And so, in this world where this first century, these first century Christians were marginalized, it does not follow that they should be people of hope. But in order for that to get observed, they have to, in fact, be people of hope in the marketplace, in their family circles, in their worlds. And so the idea is that, yes, you need to be a sold-out Christian if what that means is you're living out your Christianity in such a way as it gets noticed. And so that lingering behind the question, absolutely. So what does that mean? Well, it means conversation, it means contribution, and it means care. It means being a loving neighbor as a Christian. It means being respectful and kind to your teachers. Uh, it may very well mean having a Bible with you uh, as you go about your day, or having a Bible in your locker, or having a Bible in your backpack. It, it may mean that, but it also means, again, being faithful and being faithful in those roles that God has for you at this time in your life. All right, so the next question, how can I tell others about God where they will remember? Hmm. You know, this goes back to our job and the Holy Spirit's job. So this I find great comfort in and encouragement in. I do believe our, we play a role. God has ordained that human agents be the instruments in the proclamation of the gospel. And I find a very fascinating word that Paul uses, and it's the word persuade. Persuade does not mean manipulate. And in fact, he'll say, we are not like the many peddlers of God's Word. So this is not salesmanship, and it's not manipulation. Have you seen the tracks that are like the folded up $20 bill? And then you think, oh, it's a dropped $20 bill, and you pick it up, and it's you thought you found a $20 bill. I have something better for you, eternal life right? It's not manipulation. It's not salesmanship. But neither is it bare proclamation. We know what persuasion means. Like, you know, I can tell you uh, why you should watch my latest TikTok video, which doesn't exist. <laughs> Hypothetical situation. I'm pretty sure we all would have watched it if you actually had one. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. <laughs> I'm sure of it or I can persuade you to watch it, right? We know what persuasive means. And so, we poke and prod, but it's the Holy Spirit that convicts. So, how do we talk about God in a way that they will remember? 
I do think we have to be persuasive. And I think we can be persuasive in both our conversation and in our lifestyle that there is something here for you to think about. And then we trust in God. Then we rest in God for the Spirit to be at work in the life of that individual. And sometimes we see the fruit of that, and sometimes we don't see the fruit of that. And I, I've heard testimony of people who heard something, and 30 years later, God brings that back in their lives, and they come to Christ. So you never know. You never know. Just be faithful in putting it out there and uh, poking and prodding in a persuasive way. A question that probably wouldn't have been asked a decade or so ago. Um, if I'm invited to a same-sex wedding, should I go or not? I would say don't go. You may get other advice, and you may have others that disagree. I would say don't go, and here's why. A wedding is before God. Uh, a wedding is a recognition of the God-ordained institution of marriage, which in the pages of uh, opening pages of Genesis, in the way God designed this world, designed marriage as an institution of heterosexual relationship, man and a woman. If the United States Supreme Court redefined marriage in 2015, that does not affect God's ordination of the institution of marriage. And so, I would advise you not to go, because it is not actually a marriage before the eyes of God. How often should I read my Bible? Why? For how long? How should I read it and apply it? You, you, you might have to help me with the order there. So, daily, uh, how long? I think this varies. And, um, you know, there's different ways to crack the nut here. Uh, you can listen to the Bible. We have all these great apps. Uh, so, you can listen to the Bible. I think that's helpful. And one, may, one way to do this might be to listen to whole chapters of the Bible. We have, we have apps that will break a reading the Bible through the year. In fact, this is on the Ligonier app, that you can read the Bible through the year on the Ligonier app. You can also hear the Bible through the year on the Ligonier app. That might be a wonderful thing to do. That might be something you want to do in the morning, or if you're not a morning person and in the evening and you want to do it in the evening, that might be something wonderful to do in the evening. The off time… Maybe you just read a couple verses. Maybe it's just one verse. Maybe you just take your time working through a book. Maybe you want to read the text that your pastor is going to preach on that Sunday. And maybe you want to read it every day of that week leading up to the pastor's sermon or after the pastor's sermon. So there's different ways you can do this and find a way that is consistent with you and, and fits into your set schedule that can help you be consistent, because I think that's the key here. More than how much time and exactly how you're reading it and how many chapters or how many verses in a day, uh, find some places that really fit with you that will give you consistency, that you are consistently in God's Word and not only reading it, but also studying it. Don't forget to go a little bit deep here. Uh, as you go through and as you read God's Word. Consistency is probably the key. And it's always better to read some of God's Word than none of Absolutely. God's Word. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love this question because whoever submitted it put a nice little black heart on the question and asked the question, do we all have the same level of badness deep inside us or evilness, or are we all different, even with different personalities? So, we are, as Augustine called us, based on Paul's teaching in Romans 9, we are Adam's sinful lump. So, all of us, e even the smallest sin is worthy of eternal damnation. All of us are sinners before God. When we use the measuring stick of God's holiness, it is an equal level playing field. We are all sinners. But there is a dynamic that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1, and that dynamic is a downward spiral. As uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, it's a fallen-falling world. 
And as you read Romans 1, what do you see there? Right? As, as, as we fail to recognize God and give Him gratitude, God gives us over. And as God gives us over, what do we do? Spiral down. And as we spiral down, what happens? God gives us over, and we spiral down. We are all fallen, but I do think individuals and cultures can be at different points of a further fallenness along that being fallen continuum. And so, you look at a first century Rome, it was a pretty decadent culture. They were all fallen, but that fallenness was bragged about. That fallenness was celebrated. Uh, it's not true of all cultures and of all times. It's not true of all people. And there are some folks who, who do seem to have what, what we call pathological, a seared conscience. So I think it is true that we are all fallen, but there are also are degrees of fallenness. And um, at least that's how I read Romans 1. You, you can read Romans 1 and think through this for yourself. Well, I think a lot of people misunderstand what we mean when we talk about total depravity, that it doesn't mean we're as bad as we could be. That's right. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't mean we're all axe murderers. Thankfully. All right, this next question, how do I respond if someone asks me, how do you know that the Bible is true? Well, let's rehearse uh, some of the things that, uh, that the other professor of apologetics, Pastor Eric Bank Bancroft, uh, shared in that panel. So, first of all, we've got the Bible is in space and time. These are real events with real people in real cities, and so we can corroborate that, not prove it, but corroborate that through historical testimony and through archaeology. So, we have, we have early Roman historians, Tacitus, Suetonius, who are first century Roman historians who are writing about the existence of Jesus, the Christus, and His followers, Christian. We've got the Merneptus Stella, which references Israel and Egypt. We've got the Moabite Stone, which references events in Second Kings. We've got the Cyrus Cylinder, which uh, corroborates events in the post-exilic prophets and the post-exilic books, Ezra and Nehemiah, and of the return of Israel back to the land. So, we've got an historical book with corroboration. We've got a unique book composed over 1,400 years, 39 different authors from all walks of life. We've got Moses was educated of the finest education of his day in Pharaoh's palace to uneducated fishermen of the first century. So, not only is it 39 authors, but what a range of authors, and yet this is the only book that we speak of as one book with that composition. And then we have the issue of fulfilled prophecy, not just prophecy to come, but prophecy of Christ's first coming and prophecy of events leading up to that, going back to Cyrus. Cyrus is mentioned by name 100 years before he's born in the book of Isaiah. And so, we've got fulfilled prophecies. And so, all of this is pointing to the fact that the Bible is historically reliable there, and now here's the therefore, therefore you should pay attention to this book. That's the bottom line. The Bible tells us that there comes a point when sharing our faith that we should shake the dust off our feet and move on. When do we do that? So, I think when we talk about evangelism, let's talk about wisdom. When we talk about apologetics, let's talk about wisdom. I've often thought at these Always Ready conferences we should do a talk on Proverbs and how Proverbs applies to apologetics and evangelism. So, I think we have to be wise in how we deal with people. And we have to be wise in knowing when something's a smokescreen and we can push past it. We have to be wise when something's a legitimate question. And I think it was you said it, Pastor Bancroft, we spend a lot of time talking in evangelism and apologetics. Let's spend some time listening. 
Let's hear where people are. Let's, let's show sympathy with where people are so we can bring the gospel to bear. We can bring the reality of God's existence to bear. We can bring the reliability of Scripture to bear on their lives, and we can be apologists. So let's apply wisdom in that. And let's also apply wisdom in knowing when this is just not a fruitful time to have this conversation. And uh, forcing it and forcing the issue is not going to be of benefit to you or to that person. So, read your Proverbs and, and think about that relational wisdom that the Bible shares. That applies to how we engage in apologetics and how we apply in evangelism. Keep in mind, this was a direct command of Jesus to the disciples. Uh, keep in mind that this was the proclamation to, to Israel uh, knowing that Jesus is going to be rejected uh, by these religious leaders. And so, in many ways, who then uh, uh, malaffected the people. So, in many ways, keep that in mind as you think about the particular application of what Jesus is saying there to the disciples. But there is wisdom in Jesus' words. There is wisdom in the Proverbs. And wisdom is living skillfully. It's the application of that to real life, real world situations. And so, they're, they're, we have help here as to how we engage people. Lovely coloring in on this question here. Grateful for that. Uh, how come some people go to church but don't believe in God? Why? Thank you, Kylie. Uh, Nathan, I think about this a lot. You know, I, I did my… Um, doctoral research work in Jonathan Edwards. And uh, while I was doing that, I rubbed shoulders with a lot of folks who were historians and literary scholars, taught at top flight universities, were Edwards scholars, and were not Christian people. Uh, you can go to universities and you can find scholars who teach ancient languages and teach biblical studies and would know their Hebrew and Greek better than any of us in this room would know the historical context and data of the Bible better than any of this in this room, and they're unregenerate people. And on any given Sunday in the United States of America, you have people go into any number of churches, evangelical or not, who are not regenerate people. And you think, how can you be so close to the truth? How can you be in the truth? How can you have the language and the lingo of the truth and not be a Christian? It's a mystery. Unbelief is a mystery. And I, I think one of the things we need to recognize here is that this idea of election, uh, this idea of uh, that some believe and some don't, is in the good pleasure and will of God. And it's nothing to take lightly to be so close to the truth all of the time and yet not let it penetrate to your heart that is not something uh, to take lightly, uh, but it is a reality, and I find it a confounding reality. Can I share a story real quick? So, there was a mentor of R.C. Sproul. His name was John Gershner, and uh, John Gershner was um, quite a scholar. And back in the 1950s, he was involved in this project of publishing the works of Jonathan Edwards. And the main editor of that project was a professor at Harvard University named Perry Miller, who was an institution in American history and scholars of American history. And the project was published by Yale University Press, undergoing by Yale University Press. And John Gershner and probably two other people sitting around the table of about 16 scholars were probably the only evangelicals in the room. And John Gershner said, we all study Jonathan Edwards, but if he's right, and, and he didn't say this meanly, he said this truthfully, if he's right, then that means most of you sitting around this table, when you die, you're going to go to hell. And he, he wasn't saying it mean, meanfully, he wasn't. And Perry Miller said, you know, you're right. 
And when I heard that story the first time, I just sort of shuddered. And I just thought, how can you be so close to the truth? Unbelief is a powerful thing, and it's a mysterious thing. I want to know what would have happened if I said you couldn't share a story. I would have, I would have acquiesced, Mr. Bingham. How should we deal with people who hate on our religion during a conversation? For example, they hate on us because we don't support LGBTQ. Yeah. So this is true across the board, and I, I think this is something that is going to get more and more pressing for you. And so this, we can go back to something that was said earlier. So what does Jesus do when He sees Jerusalem? He weeps. There's this little line where Jesus is with the rich young ruler, and it's this little clause, and you almost missed it. And it says that as, as the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and tries to impress him that he's got it all together, Jesus looked at him, the text says, looked at him, and he loved him. And he said. And as you said, it's easy to have to love our friends and have friend groups that look like us. It's a challenge to love people who either don't look like us or hate us. It's hard to have compassion on those who hate us, but if we come at this with having compassion, it will help us as we engage them. Number one, don't take it personally. It's not you they hate, it's Christianity they hate, as long as you're not being a jerk, right? So don't be a jerk, uh, but as long as you're not being a jerk, it's not you they hate, it's Christianity they hate, so don't take it personally. And then the other thing you said, and I want to reiterate this, Remember, you too were an enemy of God. You may not have hated on Christianity, and you may not have, you know, worn a rainbow bracelet, but you too were an enemy of God. Keep that in mind, and it will give you a platform of compassion as you engage with these people. Oh, from time to time, we engage with the folks at Voices of the Martyr, or Voice of the Martyrs. And uh, they have story after story of Christians around this globe who are not simply facing hate speech, but are at the blunt end of physical persecution. And story after story of these folks of having not bitterness or hatred, but compassion for those who hate them. Uh, by recognizing the power of the gospel in our lives, and the power of the gospel to transform lives. So, so don't take it personally and somehow try to respond with compassion and at least have compassion as you try to frame your response. I love Jesus, but I find church boring. Can you help? If you love Jesus, you have to love what Jesus loved. And guess what Jesus loved? The church. This might be this entertainment culture we live in. It might be our prone to distraction, Lord, I feel it, uh, to, uh, to modify the hymn. Um, but, you know, be careful of what we call boring. We're talking about the eternal truths. I, lo I love, I wish, you know, Bibles used to say Holy Bible on the cover. Now they say it on the spine. I love trying to capture that every time I open a Bible. Every time you open this book, take off your sandals. You're standing on sacred ground. And if you're in a church where this Bible is opened and preached from, it is not boring. It is the eternal, living, abiding Word of God that rocks you to your socks because your sandals are off, right? If you're having a hard time with church, but you love Jesus, remember, love what Jesus loved, and He loved the church. Martin Luther made the claim of by faith alone, based on Paul's letters. However, in James, he says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Obviously, context is important, but this seems like an explicit discrepancy between parts of the Bible and theological beliefs. Could you explain this problem? 
So what, what Paul is doing is talking about our justification before God, and our justification before God is by faith. Our standing before God is by faith alone. What James is talking about is after we are in Christ as a Christian, now that manifestation of our faith in Christ, which is then by our works, which demonstrate our faith, which is not in contradiction to Paul, especially as not only do we have Ephesians 2, 8, 9, but we have Ephesians 2, 10 following 8, 9. So, and, and two times in Ephesians 2, uh, Paul says, uh, by faith, by faith are you saved. But then we come to verse 10, and now we are His workmanship created for good works. And this is very typical of Paul. Uh, Paul very much says we need to manifest God's work in our lives. We talk about Paul as having the imperative, and the imperative is based on the indicative. I know, it's a Saturday afternoon. Why are we doing a grammar lesson? The indicative is this is what Jesus has done for you in saving you. Now, here's the command, in light of that, now is how you live. It's the great therefores. Ephesians is the perfect mirror of this. Chapters 1 to 3, this is what it means to be in Christ. Chapters uh, 4 to 6, therefore, and that's how chapter 3 begins, therefore, now this is how you live, in light of who you are in Christ. So, what James is doing is looking at that manifestation of our faith before others. And that is demonstrated in our lives by our work. So, there's not a contradiction between Paul and James. Uh, you could apply the same logic and say there's a contradiction between Paul and Paul, and we know there's not. So, there's not a contradiction then between uh, Paul and James. If the Bible is sufficient, why do Reformed Christians speak of creeds and confessions? So, creeds and confessions are summations of biblical teaching. And in fact, I think there's a case to be made that uh, creeds are actually in Scripture. And so, let me just give you a, a quick example of this, because you can take a look at it uh, at your leisure. It's hard to put on your glasses, hold a mic, and find a place in the Bible at the same time. And this Bible doesn't have it marked like I thought it should. <laughs> Can we have the Jeopardy music playing in the background? It's playing in our heads. It, let, let me get to the question. So, the idea of uh, Christ was taken up in glory, seen by, uh, seen by men, vindicated by angels, taken up in glory. Uh, wherever that text is, as the author of Hebrews says, somewhere it says. Uh, so, somewhere in Paul it says, uh, seen by men, taken up, taken up by angels, vindicated. Wherever that is, look at it. It's a, many scholars think that Paul is either giving a creed to the church or he's quoting a creed that's circulating in the early church. It's, it's rhythmic, it's memorable, and even in our Bibles, except this one, it is put out in a poetic uh, fashion so you can see it. And the idea is that as we move to the Apostles' Creed or the Bishops' Creeds in the early church, these were just summations of biblical teaching in a way that we could remember it, and they served as gateways then into these doctrines. Then we move into the Nicene Creed and the Chalcedonian Creed. These are challenges then to specific heresies that popped up in the church that denied either the humanity of Jesus or the deity of Jesus or the way those two natures came together in one person in Jesus. And so, what is the Nicene Creed and Chalcedonian Creed but a summation of the biblical teaching of the whole counsel of God of who Jesus is as the God-man? They're not extra-biblical in that they're giving us new content. They're simply summarizing biblical material in a very helpful pedagogical way for us to know. Then we move into the time of the Reformation, and now we have these confessions. 
So if you're Presbyterian, you have the Westminster Standards. If you're of the Dutch Reformed, you have the three forms of unity, the Heidelberg Catechism, the Synod of Dort, the Canons of Dort, and uh, the Belgic Confession. If you're a Baptist, you have the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. And yes, cheers. I always, I always know when some, someone comes up to me at a conference and 1689 is tattooed on their arm. I know exactly where they're coming from on the theological map. What are these? But again, the summation of the whole counsel of God on all of doctrine, on the doctrine of Scripture, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of Holy Spirit. So, Reformed people like confessions because we follow Paul's advice to the Ephesian elders that while he was Ephesus, he preached the whole counsel of God. We also, though, recognize that these creeds and confessions are of a second order. The first primary place of order, the authority in our lives and in our church practice and in our doctrine is the Word of God. These creeds and confessions are of a secondary nature, but they are important to us. I go to a public school. How do I resist the temptation to speak and act like my classmates? It's very hard, isn't it, to be in the world but not of it. In fact, I think that is the, the trick of the Christian life. And throughout time and throughout stages of your life, you're going to be tempted to fall off that tightrope one direction or another. You're going to be tempted to sort of just simply withdraw and not be in the world anymore and cut yourself off. It was sort of the monastic option of centuries ago in the church, but I hear that sort of revived even in our own day of being a monastic Christian. And, and honestly, withdrawing from some elements of culture is probably not a bad idea for us. But Jesus did not save us to have us hermetically sealed in a little Christian Ziploc baggie until heaven. He said in his high priestly prayer that I am sent, you sent me into the world, and now I am sending them, meaning the twelve and meaning us. But then the temptation is strong to fall off the tightrope on the other end, isn't it, and become like the world and become of the world. So, first of all, you just have to have that in your mind. I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. I, f I have my Christian convictions, and they are convictions. I have my Christian conviction that this is indeed the Word of God, that I will study it, that I will obey it, and that I will live it, even if everyone around me doesn't think it matters at all what this book says. I have my Christian convictions that I am to show honor and respect. So even if everyone around me totally disrespects teacher or whatever in whatever class, I'm going to show respect. If everyone around me is an absolute ingrate and has never once said thank you in their lives, I know that God cares that I am a grateful person. I'm going to show gratitude. If everyone around me… Uh, is here to be served. Everybody in this universe is there for them. I'm going to follow the example of Jesus Christ, and I am going to say I am here to serve others, right? There is no more time than now for you to be a Christian of conviction in the, in the world in which you live. It doesn't mean it's easy, and it doesn't mean you're always going to get it right. I think you mentioned that, so we can ask for forgiveness and get it. Uh, doesn't mean you're always going to get it right, but it is something to strive for. And this is the trick of, Christ, of the Christian life. You're going to have the same challenge as you get older and move into a neighborhood. You're going to have the same challenge as you go to college. You're going to have the same challenge as you go to work. How do you be in the world but not of it, right? Um, it, it is the challenge of the Christian life. I grew up in the church, but I'm beginning to doubt that God exists. How can I get my faith back? So, this is why we talk about apologetics is for the Christian too. So, let's think about these things. You grew up in the church. You grew up with Bibles. You read the Bible because there's a Bible in your house. 
well, think through what we've just been saying. I mean, this, there's nothing like this book. Go ahead. Scrutinize it. The Bible invites scrutiny. You know, we, we were talking about creeds earlier, and we think of the Apostles' Creed, and I've always thought when we say the Apostles' Creed, we mentioned Pontius Pilate. Now, that, isn't that interesting? In the grand scheme of the Roman government, Pontius Pilate was a mid-level bureaucrat in a faraway colony. Think about this. In the grand level, uh, grand scheme of Roman, of Roman first century Rome, in his own day, Pontius Pilate would not make a uh, Times 100 most influential people list. And centuries later, we're still saying this guy's name. Um, but there was a real Pontius Pilate. He existed. He, he was the governor of that Roman colony. And under him, Jesus of Nazareth, who was a real person, who was born in Bethlehem, which was a real place, and, and walked on real dirt around real towns. Uh, under him, he was tried as a criminal, and he was uh, hanged on a cross, and he was put in a real tomb. And the order was given to soldiers to roll a stone in front of it. But then he appeared to two women. And then a few disciples, one of whom was quicker than the other, saw an empty tomb. And then the disciples gathered in a room as basically scared rats, not knowing what's going to happen next to them, saw him. And then what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15? Some of whom more than 500 he appeared to, some of whom are alive and remain. You know what that means? Check it out. Christianity can be scrutinized. The gospel can be scrutinized. The Bible can be scrutinized, and it will stand up to the test. Uh, ultimately, Christianity is not true or real because there's Christian churches and your parents were Christians. It's true and real because the Bible is true and real, and Jesus was true and real, and the gospel is true and real. So, keep going back to that. Keep plumbing that. And uh, also, have an older, wiser Christian help you as you walk through those questions, too. Uh, find the person you can trust and share, them, share with them your doubts and have them walk through this with you as well. As this is an apologetics conference, I think that's a great place to end. Would you join me in thanking Dr. Nichols?